and welcome to this Inspiring Cultures webinar, where we're going to be talking all about our exciting equality, diversity and inclusion training, which we're calling Building Thriving Organisations and Teams. My name's Helen Bailey, I'm part of the Inspiring Cultures team, and I've been delivering training in this space for over 25 years, both virtually and face-to-face, from small to medium enterprises, all the way through to large international corporate organisations. And I'm very happy to be sharing this with you today. But before we get into that, um, just a little piece around Inspiring Cultures, who we are, what we do. So you can see at the top of the screen, we've got cultural transformation. And if you're talking about EDI specifically, like we are today, then cultural transformation is really what we're after. And culture and climate, we are going to come back to a bit later on in this presentation. So the five pillars that kind of underpin that and make that happen, facilitation, whether it's workshops or virtually, as we've mentioned, mediation, resolving those conflict areas, providing leadership training. And again, we're going to talk a little bit about that in this presentation. Coaching on a one-to-one -one basis, and then modernizing HR policies. These are all the kind of pillars that underpin all that. So I wanted to start uh, with this quote, and I think it really speaks to what we're trying to do uh, in this space. And if I just pick out, you know, one particular phrase, it's all too easy to assume that employees working in a production line in a factory won't need EDI training. But the fact is, people will work much better together if they know how to communicate in a positive and inclusive way. This really speaks to the very heart uh, of what equality, diversity and inclusion training is about. It isn't about just training a few leaders, it's about everybody. And it also speaks to me about not only is there a very good moral case for conducting this type of training, but there is also a really good business case. Wouldn't you want people to work and work in a more positive and inclusive way? And all the research suggests that if you have a diverse workforce who can work well together, they are more likely to be innovative, they're more likely to have shorter meetings, they're more likely um, to increase profit in an organisation. And again, just who doesn't, who doesn't want that in an organisation? So let's talk a little bit about the style uh, of what we do, because I think that's really important. And then we'll get into what this really looks like, so the content piece. So the first thing to say is this training can be CPD accredited. You'll have seen the logo right on the very first slide. Um, this adds some kudos to what we're doing. It's also bespoke to your organization. I think for me, this type of training works really well when it is bespoke. So if we're talking about diversity, we're talking about your definition of diversity. If we're talking about inclusion, and we're talking about your definition of inclusion. And, and if you are, there are specific areas you would like to flag or highlight, then we can cover those as well. It's interactive. Uh, that idea of having these facilitated conversations is really important. Um, I think, well, you know, equality, diversity, inclusion often, again, gets bad rap because it sits in that compliance training. Uh, I'm going to be told about some law. Uh, I'm going to be told about some definitions. And yes, we're going to cover that, but we're going to do it in a really interactive way. Um, and that's virtually or face to face. So we use Mentimeter quite a lot. So people allow people to have anonymous contributions. Uh, we use breakout rooms. Um, we'll be using flip charts. Um, all this is about getting a conversation started in a safe space so that people can ask those questions and feel equipped to go back out in the organisation. And speaking of which, uh, for every session that we do, we provide a workbook. And the workbook is really there to help people when they get back in the workplace. So, for example... Having a microaggression conversation, and what I mean by that is challenging a microaggression, that's quite a difficult thing to go and do. So we're going to send people away with, in the workbook, a little bit of a starter to having those conversations. And they might not need it now, or they might not need it in three months, but it's there for when they do. So that workbook is really there to support that implementation back in the workplace. So let's talk about the sessions that we've got. And I really want to start here by saying, although we've kind of put together some manager content and team content, 
This is very much interchangeable. This is to give a flavor about what we can do. So it could be that you see something in the manager content and you think that'd be really good for my whole team. And that's great as well. And we can work with you to kind of put that together. The other thing I want to say is that when you look at these sessions, there's none of these sessions are taking a day. The, the biggest one is half a day. They're two hours. They're very much in that bite size space where we're going to cover the topics in an engaging way and give people something really strong to kind of hold on to and take away with them. So let's start with the first one. Um, so building a thriving team. Um, so when we're talking about this, a lot of the things we're going to be referencing is very evidence-based. It's going to be up-to-date research, you know, very much in the last couple of years. So really, what, what is the current reality of inclusion in, in the UK? We're going to be talking about the six dimensions of diversity. So when we talk about this, very much, you know, gender and race sit at the centre of this topic. But actually, there's a whole raft of other stuff we do need to be thinking about. Introversion, neurodiversity, for example. Um, so we're going to talk about all those things that make it feel included and excluded uh, in the workplace. We are going to talk about what these these terms mean, because I think they're used interchangeably. So I think it, we need to be really clear about it. And then what can I actually do to build an inclusive team? Um, you know, one of the key things you can do to build an inclusive team is be curious, ask curious, respectful questions. Um, and we are going to dig into the detail in that. You know, I think it's really easy to say, oh, be collaborative, um, you know, but inclusion is often defined as letting the quietest person in the room have a voice. Yeah. So let's really think about how do we do that? And then th really think about the microaggressions. What is a microaggression? What does it look like? What does it sound like? And how do I challenge those? How do I have a conversation around that without escalating it any further? And how do we help people? You know, I often describe about having the microaggression conversation is about an education piece. How can I help people move that forward? Okay, so if that's one about your existing team, then, then how do I hire an inclusive team? Uh, an inclusive hiring, uh, very much uh, a focus in many organizations at the moment. Uh, in one organization I've worked with, they talk about looking for people with cultural add-on rather than cultural fit. And I think that's a really nice way to think about it. You know, if you are going to have increased innovation, you need people who can add to what you've already got. So we'll talk about what is inclusive hiring and, and what gets in the way. And inevitably, we are going to talk about bias at some point here. You know, and how do we overcome that? Well, inevitably, we are going to talk about the law, particularly the Equality Act in this space. Um, this is very much, you know, what are some of the things that I can say that I can't say? What do I need to stay away from? And then how do we create an inclusive job advert and a job description? Are you using words that are more coded to men than women, for example? And that's we'll be talking about the gender coded approach. How do I get diverse candidates? How do I get them attracted to my organization? You know, it's thinking about what images you're using on your website. It's thinking about where do I place my adverts? If you've always placed your adverts in the same place, you're going to get what you've always got. So this is about helping you think about things a little bit differently. And then there's strategies for shortlisting in an inclusive way. So do you have a diverse panel? And, and remember the six dimensions of diversity? That's about embracing all of those. Um, and then really holding interviews, which adopts an inclusive hiring approach. Are you making reasonable adjustments? Well, you probably are. Uh, but have you thought about, you know, if somebody's neurodiverse, for example, um, have you thought about what's going to be the best way for them to complete any tasks that you ask them to do? If you're doing psychometric um, assessments, have you really spoken to them about the purpose for that and how that will be done? So they have a very clear understanding of that process. And as we've been talking about neurodiverse candidates, we have a session which is all about a neuroinclusive team. So it's worth saying the language changes quite a lot in this space. Um, and we've deliberately chosen to call this session Empowering a Thriving Neuroinclusive Team, because that's really about creating a workplace uh, which embraces neurodiverse people. 
And what's the reality of what that looks like? And there's a, there's a stat about autistic people, about how many autistic people actually want to work and how many people actually do work. Um, and, and that kind of takes us into that. What does it mean to be neurodiverse at work? What are some of the challenges? Uh, what are some of the opportunities? Um, you know, air traffic control, for example, will seek out neurodiverse people because of their incredible attention to detail. And I think, again, that's important. We shouldn't always be talking about challenges. There are lots of positives um, that this group can bring to the workforce. You know, what are some supportive strategies which can be adopted in the workplace? You know, for example, sending someone a message, can I have a meeting at, at one o'clock in my office? Okay. So to a lot of people, I would say, not just neurodiverse people, that's going to make them think, oh, hang on, what's going on here? But actually, if you said, can we meet at one o'clock in my office? I just want to have a chat about the following, do, 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 nothing to worry about. That is a much better way of having that conversation. You know, and then thinking about how do I have a helpful conversation when an individual tells you that they're neurodiverse? I want you to think about it's quite difficult to get a diagnosis for a neurodiverse condition. So already that person has probably been through quite a lot to get that diagnosis. And then they will have they want to come and have a conversation with you. So it's another great big step. Um, and I think it's really important how we have that conversation. And I think one of the questions I always talk about is what does that really mean for you? Because I think we'll talk about, you know, if you ADHD, for example, what does that look like? But I can give you some generalized things, but actually for that person, it might feel very different. So it's about having those conversations. And do you know what? If you asked a question at work of everybody and said to them, what, what, what will help you do your best work? That's going to be great for everybody, not just for people who are neurodiverse. And as with all these training, you know, really think about what can you do back in the workplace to support the team and others. Um, so you'll see that a lot of these sessions are about raising awareness so that when we're talking about can you take it from the manager to the team, I think they work equally well. Let's talk about menopause then, flourishing through menopause. So pick the wording of some of these is very deliberate. You know, the flourishing refers to the traditional Chinese medicine idea. And you'll have seen this if you watched Davina McCall's uh, program or read a book. Uh, the idea of menopause as a second spring. I think menopause is one of those topics that is much more commonly talked about now. Uh, and it's really helping people uh, understand some of these it's almost a, a myth debunking i think in, in some in some ways so really you know get into groups with the terms you know menopause perimenopause postmenopause what does that really mean what's the reality of menopause you know i think when we talk about symptoms we're going to talk about two things inevitably i think we're going to talk about brain fog and i think we're going to talk about hot flushes and we're probably going to talk about not sleeping i think those things very much uh, we'll come to the top, but there's a whole raft of other stuff we could be talking about here, um, you know, and, and there is a, yeah, the symptoms go on and on and some of the things you might not necessarily have thought about. Um, and what's the impact of that? And again, we're going to talk about strategies which are supportive to individuals at work. So when we're thinking about this, you know, uh, the, the recently elected Labour government in the UK has uh, talked about that large workplaces need to have a menopause policy, and that can include menopause champions, for example. Um, but it's also, you know, it's the little but big stuff I often refer to. So sanitary products in the toilets, uh, fans, wind, near being near windows, having a space uh, where somebody can go to, thinking about the, the makeup of the uniform, having a black cardigan so that if there is a, a leak or flooding, uh, then that covers that up and it enables that person to kind of walk through the office or work environment with dignity. So, and then again, it's about having a supportive conversation. And, and when we look at the case law in this area, um, a lot of it is about um, a manager saying, well, well, my wife or my partner didn't experience menopause in that way. So that can't be what that is. Um, and yeah, menopause is an individual experience. And it's probably worth noting here that menopause is not a protected characteristic. However, it does sometimes fall into that. So 
if the menopause experience is so debilitating that you know then we can start to talk about the disability characteristic within that um, and there is an example in the case law of somebody being called an old dinosaur um because they were suffering from menopause so then we're starting to talk about age as well okay so now we're talking about mental health um to mental health you know what is mental health and i think you know this is important because everybody has mental health and it, it's whether mental health is good or poor and and, the, and that's related to being able to cope uh, with the everyday challenges of life and again we're going to talk about what is the current reality of this in the uk and and it's fair to say that this is definitely on the rise um particularly again it's, it's quite challenging to get any treatment um so really there seems to be an uptake of people coming to their employers for support. It's worth saying that this is different to mental health first aid training. This is about having supportive conversations, really thinking about what you can do in the workplace. Um, if you went and Googled mental health, and I don't want you to do it right now, I'm hoping I'd like you to stay with me, but if you did, you'd probably get that as an image. Okay, but actually that's a bit of a, it's a bit misleading. Because there is something called the This Is Me campaign, which I've referred to here, which talks about, you know, I'm depressed, but I also like dancing to the Spice Girls. Um, I have anxiety, but I go mountain biking. Um, and quite often people are masking this in the, in, in the workplace. And then really thinking about common mental health challenges. And I've talked about explaining the symptoms. And this is not enabling you to suddenly start diagnosing people. But again, it's about helping understand what it looks like and then also thinking about the factors which impact mental health in the current climate um so we've had a cost of living crisis in fact we're still having to a certain extent a cost of living crisis um the energy crisis uh, we've just had an election so uh, political anxiety was a thing eco anxiety has also been a thing so those things all feed into people's mental health at work and then really thinking about um, using the algae model. Again, it's about a supportive conversation and really signposting. And this is where we can bespoke it. So what do you have in your organisation that will support people? Okay, so we've talked about the manager content. Let's, let's move on and talk about team content. And, and there are just two sessions here. The first one really speaks to that quote I showed you at the beginning, which is all about enabling people to work together in a positive way. So you'll see that some of the content kind of picks up on the themes I've talked about already. Um, so the six dimensions of diversity, individuality and identity, and how this manifests itself. And that's really leading us to talk about diversity, talking about different types of bias and thinking about the unconscious and the cognitive bias. And what can I do to overcome that? getting into the different types of microaggressions at work and that's the use of language you know because there are some things that we fall into without thinking about it and then what does it mean to be a really great ally in the workplace and that's not always about stepping in for somebody um it's about how do i support them uh, how do i enable them to make those steps and then again it's about what can i do personally to make this a great place to work and, and some of this is not about Again, it's not necessarily about the big stuff. It's the same about saying hello to somebody you don't do normally. Uh, it's about mixing up the playlist. So it's an all from, uh, you know, current music. There's a bit of the 60s. There's a bit of spy skills in there. Um, it's all those things that help create an inclusive workplace. Another session is thriving in a culturally diverse world because it is a culturally diverse world now. So what does that mean? Um, and when we talk about this, we're very much talking about cultural intelligence. And cultural intelligence is very much in the space of what are the things that I need to be aware of. And it's worth saying that you can have all the cultural intelligence in the world, but if you don't go away and use it, um, then you've kind of not, you've kind of wasted your time a little bit. I'm talking about culture and climate and culture is very much usually that stuff set at the top of the organization. It's about the vision, the values, the climate is the lived experience. And with all these things, all these sessions, quite often, 
you know, you can have the best policy in the world, but if it doesn't feel like that for people, then you don't have a culturally diverse workforce. You don't have an inclusive workforce. Really thinking about the key terms, you know, cultural intelligence, equality, diversity. And then we're going to talk about psychological safety. So the work of Amy Evanson is really important here. And how do we create the conditions which support that so that people can feel to be themselves? They feel safe to learn. I feel safe to ask a question. I feel safe to give feedback. And really thinking about why does cultural misunderstandings occur? And we'll talk about, um, you know, there is some research which suggests certain characteristics will lend themselves to certain cultures. But again, it's not, it's not about stereotyping people. It's about being able to ask respectful and curious questions. That is so important. And I can't say that enough. And I wanted to finish with something that, that kind of really speaks um, to me. This comes from the Rebel Ideas book by Matthew Syed. And in this book, Matthew Syed talks about um, a group of people who were brought together to make the England men's football team better. And this was before we managed to get to finals. So I'm guessing that, that, that it worked. Uh, Matthew Syed was part of that group. He's the table tennis player. Uh, and what was interesting about this group was that it contained people from a range of areas, not just football. And in this book, this quote, the most exhilarating moments occurred when someone in the room said something unknown to anyone else, when they offered an insight drawn from experiences that were in some way unique. In other words, when they offered what might be called a rebel idea. So earlier on, I talked about if you have a diverse workforce, you are more likely to get more innovation. This is why um, people from different backgrounds bring different ideas. They are culturally add on. And that brings me to the end. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, listening to what we've had to say. And if you'd like to talk to us further about it, please don't hesitate to get in touch and contact us at inquiries at inspiringculturelimited.com. We look forward to speaking to you soon and thank you so much for listening.